Hey guys, Jeffrey here. In this video, I want to talk to you about this concept called smart contact and also by extension, no contact. And I want to show you why smart contact may not be the best idea to do if you're trying to save your relationship. And I know that smart contact has a good spirit behind it and it's worked for some people. But in my experience and the reason why I'm making this video right now is that we've been getting a whole slew of clients right now who have been trying smart contact for the last three, six months and they realized that not only does it not work, but it actually creates more damage than if they didn't do it in the first place. And a lot of our clients, I think, who join my program, they often wish that they did not do smart contact in the first place and tried something else earlier on in their relationship building phase. And so in this video, I don't wanna just bash no contact or smart contact, but I just wanna give you the facts of my understanding of why it doesn't work and you are free to do with this information whatever you want. I know I'm gonna make some bold claims here, so if you want to see some social proof, I guess, for my claims here, that there's actually something better than smart contact that you should be trying, I want you to watch my client videos. And in my client videos, a lot of my clients talk about doing smart contact and how really it didn't really do them much good. And in fact, it often makes things a bit worse. So I want you to stick around to the very end of this video because I'm gonna show you some principles about emotions, about what it takes to rebuild relationships that often other people do not talk about. And I think if you're trying to save your relationship, these are principles that you have to understand and you have to know. And if you're new to this channel, my name is Jeffrey and I help men in long-term relationships or in marriages with the right skills, with the right knowledge to be able to design a thriving relationship for yourself. So if you want more content on this topic, be sure to subscribe to this channel and also click that bell button as well to be notified when I post new videos every single week. And before we begin this video, I also want to let you know that the masterclass, the free masterclass on the five proven steps to rebuilding your relationship from the ground up is still open. So if you want to join the masterclass and if you want to apply for the relationship revival program that I have, then be sure to stick around to the very end of this video for the announcement on how you can join the masterclass and also submit your application as well. So before we really get to the meat of this video, let's align with some definitions of what we mean when we say no contact or smart contact. Let's start with no contact. I think most of us know what this is, but no contact basically is when you are trying to withhold or avoid any type of conversation, any type of communication with your partner at all costs. And this is often done with the spirit of trying to create some form of intrigue, some form of curiosity, or it's done with the intent to create some space between you and the problem to let the wounds heal a bit. And with no contact, the thing to note too is that you are trying to avoid contact even when your partner reaches out to you. So even when she reaches out to you, you're basically avoiding contact in order to further that healing process or to further that creation of the intrigue that I will miss you kind of feeling. And when we talk about smart contact, this is, I think, something that's been trademarked by a marriage helper. This is sort of a slight modification of no contact. Basically, this is saying definitely have contact, but don't be pushy with your interactions. And not only are you not pushy, but you're really trying to keep conversations light to the lighter things, to the everyday things, to the business items, as they call it. And you're not trying to initiate the tougher conversations or any conversations, but you're just trying to let your partner initiate those conversations with you. But when your partner initiates, you're trying to uh, respond in a very strong, in a very assertive, in a very proper way. And so here I'm not proclaiming to be the expert on what uh, smart contact really is. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I would check out the Marriage Helper channel for that as well. But while this principle sounds good in theory, I think when you put it into practice, it starts to break down. And to understand how this starts to break down, I want you to start understanding the basics of emotions. And the reason why we talk about the basics of emotions here is that I need you to understand how important emotions are really are to saving the relationship. Because when your partner decides that she wants a divorce or separation or the end of the relationship, it's not her logic talking. It's really that she doesn't feel like she wants to be in here anymore. It's more of an emotional feeling. And so if we want to save our relationship, we need to be able to appeal to those emotions as well. And for us to appeal to those emotions, we have to be able to understand how emotions work in the first place. So let's spend a minute here talking about the nature of emotions, starting with how do emotions form in the first place? So if you've been watching my videos a lot, you will know this chart quite well. It's that, let's say an event happens and the event here doesn't cause the emotions itself, but the event passes through the lens of our paradigms. And our paradigms, again, are simply our beliefs, our deeply held beliefs, our deeply held philosophies, our, the way we perceive the world, basically. And so the event passes through this lens that is our paradigms, and our paradigms will then color our interpretations. 
And these interpretations in turn, the way we interpret our world will determine the feelings we have towards that event, towards our world, etc. Now we've gone really, really deep into this topic in many of my other videos, so I'm not gonna belabor this point too much, but again, don't overcomplicate this. For now, I, the one takeaway I want you to have here is that the events itself, the things that happen in your life, doesn't really cause your emotions or your partner's emotions, but it's the way you or your partner interprets those events that creates the emotions. Now, the second thing to understand though about these emotions and these interpretations and these paradigms is that they're often very subconscious and very reflexive. So often we don't even know we're thinking about something because these paradigms that we're talking about have been deeply ingrained in our subconscious over our childhood, over our previous experiences in life. And so when we face an event, we often perceive it through our paradigms in a very reflexive and a very subconscious way. But you'll realize very quickly how many of the paradigms we have, we know it's there. We know we have hundreds of thousands, even millions of paradigms about relationships about how we live our life, but we can't really name it because all these things are in our deep programming, in our deep subconscious. And if our paradigms are reflexive and subconscious, then often the way we interpret our world is also gonna be very subconscious and reflexive as well. And if that's subconscious and reflexive, then our emotions will be subconscious and reflexive as well. And this is really why sometimes if we can find ourselves in a very emotional state and someone asks us, what's going on? We don't really know why because a lot of the ways, the mechanism by which these emotions arise in the first place are very subconscious. Now, again, don't overcomplicate this. Again, the only takeaway I want you to have with this point is that our emotions are reflexive and very subconscious. They can arise without even us consciously wanting them to arise. Because again, the paradigms and their interpretations are very subconscious and very reflexive as well. Now, the third thing to understand about these emotions is that they're also highly irrational and very subjective. So you could, for example, put a thousand people in the same room, in the same temperature, in the same setting, looking at the same things. You can even do a controlled trial study where you put a thousand participants in the same chair and those thousand people will have very different emotions, very different feelings about the same event. That's because again, our paradigms are very highly subjective. And these paradigms are determined by our history, our past, our childhood, which is unique for everyone. And when we talk about different paradigms, we're not just talking about one different paradigm. We're talking about millions of different paradigms that lead to eventually an infinite array of different ways that people could potentially interpret different events. And this is also why sometimes we can be finding ourselves doing something good, doing something that I think we think will make our partners happy, but our partner can still misunderstand that. So you could be saying, for example, I love you and I wanted to try to save this relationship and your partner can somehow see this as a bad thing and try to twist and bend it into a bad thing. And this is again because our interpretations are really subjective and can be sometimes very irrational. Number four, the fourth thing we need to understand is really the self-confirming nature of our emotions as well. What do I mean here? So let's say you start with an event and the event is that your partner starts to resist you a bit. Maybe she stonewalls you, she shuts down on you and says, ah, I don't wanna to talk to you anymore, I wanna end this conversation. Now, if you have the paradigm, if your beliefs about the world and your partner and the relationship here is that the relationship won't work if you're with a bad communicator. You can't be with a bad communicator. And if you believe here that your partner is a bad communicator, then the interpretations you're gonna make are gonna be quite negative about that. And when you have a negative interpretation, you're also gonna to start to have a negative emotion about that. You might feel a bit hopeless, a bit annoyed, a bit angry at your partner, a bit frustrated. Now what happens is if you take a look at the emotions that you have, these emotions can then become the new event. In this case, it becomes an internal event. This anger that you feel is now an event in itself. Now, when you look at this event of you feeling angry, when you feeling hopeless, you can create a new layer of interpretations there. So here, it passes through the same paradigms you have, which is again, that your partner can't communicate, that it's impossible, this relationship is hopeless if you both can't communicate. Then you make the same interpretation that, oh my gosh, this me feeling angry, I'm justified for feeling angry. I should feel angry. And that makes you even more angry, more hopeless. Here, one event really happened. The event was that your partner starts to resist you. And with this one event, you start to have this internal process where you start this emotional flywheel where your paradigms essentially are confirming itself. And this emotional flywheel effect, this self-perpetual nature of emotions is why it can be sometimes really difficult to talk someone out, for example, out of their depressive state. Because if someone's really depressed, what happens is, I mean, one event might have happened, but they play out this loop so many times in their head, internally, and they have convinced themselves through many different loops of reasoning 
on why what they feel is justified, why they feel is correct, why their paradigms are correct about the world, about life, etc. Which is why it's again, it's impossible sometimes to get someone out of that depressive state sometimes. And number five, the fifth nature of emotions here is that again, this emotional flywheel that we talk about where things become self-perpetual, that's how confirmation bias is created. The self-perpetual nature of emotions can happen very quickly. It can happen uh, within seconds of you sitting on a couch, for example, and you're watching a comedy show. You think one bad thing, that one bad thing leads to a bad emotion, that a bad emotion gets filtered through your paradigms again, causing more bad emotions, etc., etc., etc. And this can happen within a few seconds. And this happens very subconsciously without us even being aware of it sometimes. It happens very irrationally sometimes because when we're in a negative state of mind, that loop can be very irrational in a very negative way. And also, it can happen without any new external event actually happening. So again, this is how strong confirmation bias is formed. Confirmation bias does not need an event to happen. It can happen all internally. And this is again why we can be sitting on a couch and our partners could have said something mean to us last week and we can be sitting on a couch right now and thinking and replaying all these things in our head, playing out this emotional flywheel and suddenly finding ourselves feeling really, really terrible, really, really bad about something. These are the five natures of emotions that I want you to understand for the sake of this video. Now there's more implications to this, but I don't want you to overcomplicate this because really when you understand these five things, we really start to understand why no contact or smart contact may not be the best idea. So if you're in a long-term relationship, you're in a marriage and your partner wants a divorce, or separation is usually because there's been many different loops of this negative confirmation bias that happened in your relationship. And so now your partner has a very negative confirmation bias about you. And a lot of you who might be saying too that, oh, but I'm trying to do the right things here. I'm trying to do the nice things here. Well, what's right or what's logical is not really the point. That's irrelevant. Again, because the nature of emotions is that it's very subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. Do you understand that your partner's confirmation bias, the paradigm she has about you is already negative. Then you have to understand here that when you do nothing, a negative paradigm begets even more negative paradigms. So here, the event here is that you're playing out no contact and you could be playing out no contact for a very good reason, out of a very noble reason because you wanna heal that relationship out of a non-manipulative tactic. But again, this event of you trying to play out no contact passes through your partner's paradigms the way she's been trained to see the world to see you. And if your partner wants a divorce here, there's a good bet that these paradigms are gonna be very negative. For example, she could be saying in her head, you know what, I feel hopeless right now because this guy, he doesn't even understand what he did wrong. He doesn't even understand how much I actually wanted this relationship, how much I actually tried to save this relationship, but he doesn't care. And so if she looks at your no contact and she passes it through that paradigm, that subjective, maybe irrational paradigm is irrelevant, then her interpretation will be when you have no contact will be, I knew it. The fact that he's trying to play games with me now and pretending like he doesn't care about me shows me that he doesn't actually understand what I'm actually looking for. And so if that's her interpretation, she's gonna feel quite angry, quite hopeless and quite upset. Now, the thing to note here is that because of the nature of emotions, you could be doing this event, this no contact from a very noble perspective, but this can be drastically misunderstood depending on her paradigms. And because right now her paradigms are already negative, she's most likely gonna see this as a negative thing. And so when you play out no contact, the worst part is that you will have no idea that this is happening. And if you have no idea that this is happening, then you have really no control over trying to remedy it. So when you play out no contact, what usually happens is that you're just allowing that confirmation bias, the negative confirmation bias to run rampant. And this is why it rarely works for long-term relationships or for marriages. Now, when we talk about no contact, it might work for a short-term relationship setting or when you're dating, because when you're dating, there's not a lot of that negative confirmation bias that can guide the emotional flywheel. But in the case of long-term relationships or in marriages, there's already guaranteed a lot of negative baggage that is fueling this emotional flywheel. And if you just leave it alone, you're just basically saying that you wanna let the emotional flywheel keep going, which is why no contact is highly ill-advised when you're trying to save your relationship that is long-term relationship or in marriages. Now let's look at smart contact though. And this brings up the same problems for the same reasons, a lot of the same reasons as no contact. Because basically here, when you're so afraid to push, when you're so afraid to get the conversation to where it actually needs to go, 
you're also going to let those negative emotions run rampant. Because here's what smart contact says, for example, that you're waiting for your partner to bring up the difficult stuff, to bring up even sometimes business items. That the only thing you can, you can bring up really is the light things, the business items, the day-to-day -day stuff. But if you've been following me for a while, you also know here that the reason why your partner feels hopeless and wants a divorce is that there is a lack of safety. There's a lack of safety to express yourself. And we always say here that the problems are not really the issues itself. But the problem, the real problem is that you have the issue and there's no safety for your partner or you to bring up the issues together and resolve it together. That's the part. The lack of safety is what makes us feel really, really hopeless about a relationship and what makes us feel like we want to leave. If we have an issue, but we know that we have the safety to be able to bring it up to resolve it, we won't feel as hopeless. We would keep trying in the relationship. And the only way, the only reason we stop trying is because there's a problems and there's no safety as well. The safety is really the root core of the issue. And if you want to watch more videos on this, I suggest you follow me, join my masterclass as well. And so here your partner wants out due to safety issues. And the safety issues means that your partner can't really talk to you about things. And now you're, we're saying, we want our partner to initiate the conversations. When we initially said that they cannot initiate because there's no safety. See how roundabout this is. See how circular this is. Smart contact rarely works and people often regret it because when you wait on your partner to, to bring things up like this, they're often never gonna bring it up. They might bring up one or two things, the surface things, but they're never gonna bring up the hard things, the real things, the root core things that actually will make a difference. And if they never bring it up, then again, you're basically letting the same thing happen. You're letting the same confirmation bias, negative confirmation bias run rampant again. Same reason as no contact. And also note here, by playing this very passive role like this, there's also a very high chance that what you're doing can be misunderstood as well. The same way what you're doing when you're doing no contact can be misunderstood as well. So again, the light conversations doesn't really solve the real issues, but also the light conversations can also be, for example, misinterpreted as you being avoidant, you being aloof, which has happened to a lot of our clients before. When you're hearing this and I'm telling you in this video, don't do no contact or don't do smart contact, look for a more active, look for a more finessed approach than these two. I wanna give a massive word of caution here in that I'm not saying here that you should be like Rambo just coming in with your guns blazing, pushing your partner and just keep campaigning relentlessly and annoying the crap out of your partner. I mean, doing that is like the best way to get a restraining order. Don't do that. I'm not saying you should do that. The right answers in life are never in the extremes. It's never that you should do this 100% or do that 100%. It's always in the middle. And the right answers are always not in the what, the structure of what you do. And what I mean the structure is when we say, what should I do? Should I do no contact? Should I do smart contact? Should I reach out? Should I not? It's not in whether you should reach out or not. But the real answer, the secret usually lies in the how. It's how you should reach out, how you should contact your partner. This video is getting a bit long, so I can't get too deep into this in this video. But if you want to learn more about what this right process, the right how looks like, then really what it takes is to understand the right mindsets, the right subconscious mindsets for you to be able to play out the right frameworks so that you can dance around in these interactions, whether it's something that it's a conversation that you start or a conversation that your partner starts, it doesn't really matter. And once you understand these mindsets and these approaches, these frameworks, then you can start to have a more surgical approach where you can still be pushy, a little bit pushy, but you're pushing in the right way that doesn't seem very pushy. The how is really where the magic is. And I know I'm making some bold claims here again, but so if you want to see a lot of my client stories who have tried smart contact, who have tried all these different ways, then I want you to watch my client stories of how they went for smart contact and finally understanding here that there's actually a lot of ways that they can navigate through the conversation to where they can still push but not seem pushy at the same time. And if you want a very in-depth look into this process and learn this process yourself so that you can graduate to a more finesse approach than just doing smart contact and no contact, then I want you to join me in my free masterclass on the five proven steps to rebuilding your relationship from the ground up. In that masterclass, I'll show you the exact same steps that all my clients have used to get massive success despite being in very dire situations. And if you want to submit your application for the Relationship Revival Program, you can also do so at the end of this masterclass where we'll give you the instructions on how you can apply as well. And if you wanna join the masterclass, then be sure to click the link above my head or also down below this video. 
And if you're looking for a guide that can help you get a taste of what one of these frameworks are in our program, then you can also download the guide I have for you above my head, also down below this video. And finally, if you wanna join a free community where you can talk about your issues and a member of my team will help answer them for you and give you clarity, then you can also join me in my free Facebook group down below this video as well. And in the meantime, if you found this video insightful, uh, feel free to leave a comment. I would love to hear from you. And if you like this video, find it to be valuable, give it a like, it really helps the channel out and subscribe to this channel for more content like this one as well. In the meantime, I wanna leave you with these two other videos, the videos that we mentioned in this video itself uh, with more mindsets, more knowledge for you to design a thriving relationship, no matter what situation you're in right now. For now, I'll see you in the next video.